We have one candle not lit this time. I've been told I preach too long, and so we need longer candles next year. So, uh, but uh, while we're there, we didn't want to catch the Advent wreath on fire this year. So, so that's why we only have uh, four of the candles. So we're in the last day of the Advent season. Um, we've been talking about Advent, and Advent's that time of year where we come together and we look at the coming of Jesus. Advent means it's that the word that talks about uh, looking forward to to someone or something of importance showing up. And so when you look at the Old Testament and we look at uh, all of the Israelites and what they did, they were looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And we get to look back at the coming of Jesus. And we look at this and we look at this man who uh, was born as this little baby in a manger, right? How many of us have a nativity scene at home? of some type, right? We, we look about this and we talk about it every year and we talk about baby Jesus and we talk about him coming and we look at him and we look at this man that grew up that we know not a lot about for his adolescence and early years, but then we see his three years of ministry in the gospels. And then after that, we get to look back and see how this person, how this baby changed the world. Um, it is pretty easy for us to say that Jesus changed the world, right? Now, I was looking at some studies last night. Uh, the, what Barna did a study, 91% of people believe Jesus was real. So when you think of that as a historical person, the mass majority of people do not argue whether or not Jesus was a person or Jesus existed. History tells us that. If you ever have a conversation with someone that says, you know, why do you believe in Jesus? You can always start with, well, he existed. That is a proven fact. You can't take that one away. The question is, is he who he says he was? That's the debate. That's the question. And if we look at that, we know that Jesus, you know, when he lived and when we look at the Bible, that he totally disrupted the culture at the time, right? He, he disrupted the Romans and he disrupted the Israelites. And we look at all of that and we see the effects of him to the point that all of these millennia later, we are sitting here talking about baby Jesus and what he did for us. And we, we get to do it today on a very special day, on the day of Christmas as well. And we look at this where we have this opportunity where our church life kind of joins up with a kind of a cultural celebration and also a religious celebration. And the reason I say that is because in all honesty, Christmas has about a billion different definitions. What people are doing today is very individualized on what today means to them. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the church or whether you're out of the church. You know, I've been on Facebook just seeing the battles. Um, it is crazy. The battles going on right now on whether you should have church or not on Sunday. And, and that instead of spending all of our energy or our thoughts and our focus on Jesus, we're being distracted by the enemy of whether or not we should be in a building or not. Now, we're supposed to come together. We're supposed to join. We're supposed to have Sabbath. There's some things that we are supposed to do. But the specifics of that are a little bit, you know, you have to think about those in your family. But what I'm finding is as you look at the stuff that's going on is that most people are not talking about Jesus. They're talking about secondary things. They're talking about what we should or shouldn't be doing and stuff like that. And I think there's, there's a tendency, well, I don't think there's a tendency. The Bible and history tells us that there is a tendency, a natural tendency in human beings to walk away from the things of God. We see it from the very beginning. We see it in the history of Israel, of Israel getting in line with God and then walking away, following other little gods, other spirits, other ways of life. They come back and then they fall away and they come back and they fall away. This summer, we looked at the book of Malachi, and the book of Malachi was like the last prophet in the Old Testament to tell Israel, get it together, get back on the right track, go back to God and do what God asked you to do, right? And we just see that over and over and over again. And you get into the New Testament, and that same theme does not go away. We see, we see uh, writers in the New Testament warning about false teachers, 
warning about people that are going to take your focus off of Christ, telling them, go back to the teachings that we first gave you, right? We see Paul say, go back to what we told you. Stop inventing all of these other things. Stop creating all of these other extras. Go back to Jesus. And I guess we get to look here today, and we get to spend some time this morning of asking the question, maybe it's one of the questions, is do we focus more or maybe less on Jesus on Christmas Day than in any other time of the year? Because I think there's probably both worlds. I think there's times where we focus like right down on him, and this is the day that we spend all of our time, and we think about him, and it's the, it's the day we focus on him more than any other day of the year. And then there's other people that are so busy with everything that's going on that it may be the day that they think about him the least. Um, but as we look at this, as we go into here, the question should be, is it's kind of like anniversaries. Um, we kind of have a thing in our, when our kids were little, we don't have any family in town. So when our kids were little, we used to take all of our kids out to the restaurant, and people thought we were insane for taking our four little kids out to Outback and out to Applebee's. And, but that's just what we did. It was either that or not go out. Um, and people were like, well, well, that's a special day. Why would you have your kids there? I'm like, well, for me and for most people, it's like I love my wife every day. It would be nice to be special. But if I save all my love for the anniversary and I only spoil my wife and I only love my wife on the anniversary, is that really the definition of love? And I think when we look at Christmas Day and we look at what we're doing on days like this, the question should be is do we follow Jesus and love him and focus on him as much every day of the year as we do on this day? This day should be a special pinpoint in the end of a long thing, not just something that we do special things for on this day. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look into who Jesus is, what the Bible says he is, and hopefully maybe clear up some things because we must be honest in our current culture, we're moving fast away from teaching again, right? The core teachings of the Bible are getting further and further from the mouths of pastors and from the mouths of these believers. We're starting to argue about secondary things all the time. We're not, we're not even sharing the gospel. We're not talking about people being saved. We're talking about what kind of music and all this other stuff that comes along for the ride. And I just feel like I hear Paul ringing in, in, in our ears saying, you know, get back to the basics. Go back to the Bible. Go back to what happened when Jesus came to earth and what his purpose was. And so we're going to look at that today, why Jesus came. You know, it's kind of, you know, we look at Elf on the Shelf and all the effort we do there. You know, we need to make sure that, you know, we need to put Jesus back in the right place. Or, or maybe we have no control of Jesus being in the right place. Maybe we need to put ourselves back in the right place. To put ourselves, you know, where do we sit under the teachings of Christ? Where do we sit under who he is? Or do we continually move him around our lives like the elf in all sorts of the funny little ways that we have elves floating around everywhere? Do we compartmentalize him and make him fit our life? Or do we submit our life to him? So open with me to Colossians chapter 1. And we, our main text today is going to be verses 14 um, through 23. So go ahead and turn there. And then we will stand and read God's word this morning. So when you're ready, go ahead and stand. And we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, verses 14 through 23. So it says, In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have 
all his fullness dwell in him, and through him reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifting away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. You may be seated. So we're going to look at three things that Jesus is over today. In those scriptures, we'll see that Jesus is over all of creation, that, that he is bigger than just what we usually focus in on Christmas Day. He is also, uh, he is also over death. Like he, he has come and he has uh, overcome death so that we can have life. And we'll see that he is still over us as well. So as you look here, God has the first verse there. It says, in him we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. So God has rescued us from, if you go back to uh, previous verses, it says that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his son. He says that those that believe in him were in darkness and it was God that transferred us into, and he transferred us through this thing called redemption. So what does it mean to be redeemed? What does that word mean? It means, um, it means the release of people, property, or animals from bondage through payment of a price. Okay, so, so to be redeemed means there's something that's in bondage, something that's been sold, something that someone else has, and it's being held captive by whatever legal or bounds it is. The redemption is to pay the price to release it from bondage, okay? And what the Bible says is each and every one of us who is ever born has been born into the bondage of what? The bondage of sin. We are, after Adam and Eve, everyone, after the initial sin, we all have and we're all born into something called sin, a nature that is against God. Now, we may do things in that nature that align with God out of our own personal beliefs and stuff like that, but it doesn't come from God. And like property, you know, if you if you own a field that someone you've, you've given as collateral for a loan, it's in bondage, right? You've given your property as collateral, right? That property on its own can't develop its own way of paying for itself, right? It has no ability to raise the ransom for that, raise the, pay the payment for itself. See, we as people feel that we can raise and do the good things that need to do to pay to be redeemed by God. But like property and like animals, it wasn't us who paid that ransom. It was Jesus who did. It says, in him we have redemption for the, fi for the forgiveness of sins. We needed someone. We needed something or someone to make that payment on our behalf. And today is Christmas Day. We get to look and focus on the one who made that payment. And then the way that that payment was made to release us from the bondage of sin, to be forgiven of our transgressions, to be forgiven of our sins. But when we look at Jesus, most of the time we speak of the time where he was born and the time that he died, which are super important to our faith. But he is more than just a man or more than God coming and having a second or, you know, God's son, having two natures of fully human and fully divine coming and paying the penalty for us. He is more than that. And so when we look at this today, Colossians 1.15 says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. See, God has no form that we can see. Scripture says that no one has ever seen God except through Jesus, who reveals the Father. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16 says, God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be the honor and eternal power. Amen. 
John 1.18, which we read, it says, no one, ever, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. So God has been revealed through Jesus to mankind. If you want to know who God is, if you want to know who, who he is and what his characteristics are and what he looks like, you look at Jesus. You look at his word and you look at Jesus. Jesus is revealing God to us. And when we look at this word firstborn, this is one of those words that people get caught up on. When you look at the word firstborn, it literally doesn't mean Jesus was the firstborn. In, in the text and in the words, it means he came first or he preceded. So it says that he was the firstborn over all creation. It means he preceded creation. He was there before. And we look at this thing, also Colossians 1.16, or continuing, it says that for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So what did Paul say there? Did he say some things were created? No, it says everything was created by him. Created by who? By Jesus. For everything to be created by Jesus, he had to precede everything that was created. You know, most of the time we can get kind of caught up that we only focus on this moment in time and we start thinking from that point forward. But Jesus was around before everything. It says everything in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, all of the authorities of this world and all things have been created by him through him, and for him. So is Jesus a little bit important? All things are created through him, by him, and for him. John 1, 3 says, All things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. Romans eleven thirty six says, For from him and through him and to him all things, to him be the glory of forever. Amen. This Jesus, this man that walked this earth, the Bible says in his divine nature was here before anything else was ever there. Does this leave anything out? Anything that we know of, if we believe that the scripture is true, if we believe that it is infallible, that means Jesus is over it all. That means each and every one of us exists because we were created through him, by him, and for him. We look at what the world focuses on today, and that's not the Jesus that we see people talking about, do we? Who do we see people talk about Jesus most often? Is he the self-help specialist that makes me feel better about who I am? Is he a place I confess my sins to and then go back and do my sins more because I've been forgiven by grace? Is that the Jesus? Do we take this Jesus who created everything and boil him down to someone that we can put on a shelf like Elf on the Shelf and pull him down when we're having a bad day? Is that the Jesus that we have? Is that the Jesus that we believe in? Is that the one who came to earth to save us? You know, is, is he a fairy godfather that just justifies behaviors and makes us, you know, answers prayers to make ourselves be better? It's hard to say, but Jesus didn't come to earth to make us feel good. Is that a correct statement? He came to earth to save us from ourselves. He came to earth for one purpose, to die and to redeem us back to him. A redemption that only he could do. A redemption that we have no power to solve in its own, in our own power and our own will. We are created by him, through him, and for him. He is the center of everything, is he not? The air we breathe, the life we have, 
We look around at all of the abundance that we have today, and it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing to live in a place that we live in today, to, to realize what we have, or maybe to not have to realize what we have. That, you know, we have homes that keep us out of minus nine degree weather. We have an abundance of food on the tables today when there are others that do not. We have hope. When all the world falls apart, we have hope. I remember sitting my first child. I don't know about you dads, but childbirth is a very scary place to be in the hospital. There are bells and whistles and things going on. And of course, as an engineer, I start equating bells and whistles, uh, response times of nurses and numbers of nurses. So I know when bad things happen, you know. But I'm sitting there with my first child and not my cup of tea. I'm not a hospital guy. I don't like surgeries. My wife loves them. And I'm sitting here and I'm reading the IV bag because that's all I could do was read the IV bag. I was like over and over and over again. And in my mind, all of a sudden, there was this thought that says, if the worst thing in the world were to happen today, it would be horrendous, but they would both be saved. That I would see them again, or they would be taken care of because my wife was a believer. It was this thought that was there, and it was the most comforting thought and one of the most uncomfortable situations I've ever been is because things weren't going great in that pregnancy, and they were fixing things and solving things, and but... There is a hope and peace that comes from knowing that Jesus is in control of it all. Because not only does he create everything, he also sustains life as we know it. It says in verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things hold together. We also see in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it says, Yet for us there is one God the Father, all things are from him, and we exist for him. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ. All things are through him, and we exist through him. In Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, In the last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Sustaining all things by, the powerful, by his powerful word. Do you realize we exist because he wills us to exist? He spoke through him. God spoke, and through Jesus, everything was created. If God wasn't the God that he is, he could undo everything with just the will of his word, right? But our God does not lie. Our God does not change. And he does not fail. And so when we look to the scriptures and we look to the truth and we look to the promises that he says will happen, we have hope and faith that he will sustain us. As we looked a couple of weeks ago, that he keeps us. They were kept by him as saved believers as his children that he keeps us and guides us and guards us until we see heaven we have that trust because he is true and he doesn't fail and he can sustain and can do anything that he wants to he's sovereign and maybe you're asking you know if this is all true maybe you're here and you think this is just hogwash right that there's just a whole bunch of um, pie in the sky, dreaming going on here, and you're asking about what about all of the evil we see in the world? All about the hurt, all about the bad, the pain, you know, all about the violence. Where does that come from? Did God create all of that as well? We see in Romans chapter 1, and if you read chapter 1, there's a lot of it, you'll see that human beings have a great ability to create evil ways of doing things. We've seen it throughout history. If there's anything that we can do, we can create destruction and chaos very well. We do it in our homes. We do it in our lives. We do it at the world scale. It is something that comes very natural to us. And in Romans 1, 28 through 32, the reason this happens is because when sin entered the world, our minds were corrupted. 
There was something that broke. There's something that changed. It says, and because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do not, so they do what is not right. They are filled with all kinds of unrighteousness, evil, greed, wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. Although they know God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they even applaud others who practice them. What scripture says is that it's not just ignorance many times. Many times in our world, there are people, and we've been there at times, where we know that what we're doing is not right. And we continue to do it anyways. And scripture says we even applaud as, as human beings. We applaud, we, we stand up and we cheer when we, people create new ways of doing evil. And we see that from time to time. We see that in history. We see things that, that they're there. Men create all sorts of horrible things. And we've been doing it from the beginning, from Cain and Abel, from the first murder that happened right at the very beginning. And yet Jesus still came. We've been creating evil, and we've been doing evil things. We have been doing atrocities as mankind for the entire existence of, of man. No matter what you believe religiously, men have been creating evil ways forever. And even though we have been doing that so well, even though men have created all of these ways to do things against God. Our God loves us so much that he still came as a baby to die on a cross to redeem us back to him. All of that didn't change God's plan. And not only does he, has he died for us and been risen, he is over death. Otherwise, none of this would be happened. We wouldn't be saved. If Jesus had not been able to die and be raised again, we would not have life either. So Colossians 1.18, he is also the head of the body of the church. He is beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. So here's that firstborn again. So first he had to overcome death, and by him overcoming death, by being resurrected, then we can have life as well. And he came as the, once again, first fruit, as the pre precessor, precessor, predecessor, came before everyone else. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And Romans 8, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Once again, knowing what the words mean, mean a lot, because this is where some of the false religions believe that, you know, we, as Jesus being firstborn, they change what that means, and then they take brothers and sisters and change what that means, and they create their own belief system based on that. But Jesus overcame death to reconcile men back to him. Colossians continues with, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell with him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Without Christ dying on the cross, without his death, there is no peace with God. Now, we may think that's weird. We may think that's out of this world, that that's the way it is. But that is what God demanded. And that's what God did for us. To pay that debt, to reconcile us back to God so that we could have relationship with God again. And that payment, once again, was a payment that we could not make. No one could be born and raised to live the perfect life that Jesus did. Right? We have countries that... 
take babies from the very beginning and they take them to raise them to be the best basketball player of all time, right? They, they just take kids and they train them to be whatever they want to be. This is something that could never happen because every person born is born with the bondage of sin. Acts 26, 23 says that the Messiah would suffer and that as first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to the people and the Gentiles. So Jesus has conquered death for us to have life. So not only is everything created through him, created for him and by him, he also died so that we can be, we can have spiritual life again. And God is still, or Jesus is over us as well. We'll finish up Colossians here. It says, once we were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all of creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Once again, it says we were hostile towards God. How many of you remember the time that you were hostile towards God? That you were saved as an adult or saved far enough into knowing that you were, you know, what you did was against God. You know, some, sometimes it's kind of hard with those that are, you know, come to uh, Christ early on. They don't quite have the same kind of history in the back of their mind where they see that type of stuff, even though they were. But we were hostile in many different ways. And we, we find that there comes a point in time where we believe that all of a sudden we start to see that we are hostile against God. Well, I did. I blew out the wrong candle. Well, you guys all wanted to show this morning, right? There you go. But De Debbie says she wants them all out now. It's always something, right? I saw her face. And I was like, what did I say? Like, like the reactions was like, ah, there was no point there that should have got that reaction. So, but now I feel much better because I thought I was going astray for a little bit. But um, my timer's up. Mary says it's time to go home and eat food. Well, Jesus is in control of everything. I guess we needed a break. Um, Yeah, getting back on track a little bit. But as we're reconciled back to him, there's something that's in there. It says, but now we have been reconciled to you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless. So what does holy mean? To present us pure. No flaws. Blameless, unaccusable. We will stand, those that believe in Christ will stand before God at the end, unaccusable. In Christ's blood. And unblemished. So we will be pure, unaccusable, unblemished. Or holy, faultless, and blameless. How many of us would love to feel that way right now? holy, unaccusable, blameless. Those that believe in Christ will get that experience in the end. And there's a word in here that I have to do. It says, it says, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in faith, this if is a tricky word here. If you read it in the English language, what does it make it sound like? There's a condition here, right? And the word here that's used, it's not a condition in the sense of what will happen. 
It's a condition of what's already happened. So one commentator put it this way, and I, I'm just going to repeat it because I don't know if I could explain it as well as he did. I think I have this on the screen. It says, this is not a conditional clause that is based on the future. The if that Paul uses here is the if of argument. It does not mean that something shall be if something else is true. Rather, it means that something was if something else is true. We would say, since ye continue in faith, grounded and settled. Paul's point is that we have been reconciled. It is an accomplished fact. So if you are a child of God today, you will continue in the faith, grounded and settled. You will not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. So this is one of those English words that you have to, you know, it's, we've translated it into if, but it's more since. Since you have been reconciled, we will be grounded and steadfast in faith. Because of the reconciliation, these are the things that come. Steadfastness and faith. And we'll be presented to Jesus when he comes. So finishing up here, 2 Corinthians 4, 14 says, For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to you. And Romans 5:10 is for for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more have been reconciled will we be saved by his life? So as we conclude today, after we've set the church on fire and all sorts of stuff like that, um, and we'll have communion today, is that we need to ask ourselves a couple questions. Do we really focus on Jesus the way the Bible talks about us focusing on him? Do we bring him down to a savior when we need it? Do we treat him like, um, I had one gentleman, I called it the get out of jail free salvation, right? You meet Jesus, you shake your hand, thank you for your sins, I'll see you on the day of judgment, right? And then you go about living your life, but you feel like you've made the decision and that's your relationship with Jesus. It's a contract that you believe will get paid in full at the day of your death. There are that's literally one guy's view that I talked to in church, right? It was a contract. Is he someone that we just talk about and watch movies about on Christmas Day? Or do we look at him and realize how big Jesus is and how special it was for him to do what he did for us and the demonstration of his love to do that for those that were his enemies. And with that, as we've seen through the Advent season, we've seen because of his death on the cross that we now in this life are given his joy. We get to rejoice in a world that sometimes can be hard to find joy in, correct? We can have peace in a world that looks like it's just not ever going to be peaceful, right? It's just going to get worse probably. And we have hope. We have hope that this world isn't all there is, right? How many of you are, are so thankful that you're looking forward to something different than this world? Do we box Jesus? Do we bring him down to our standards? Or do we continually, every day, throughout the 365 days of the year, are we continually reminding ourselves that we are who we are, that we are sinners that are saved by the grace of God. And that we still need him to grow in us. We still need to develop. And that as we grow and as his love fills us, that we will share that love back out into the world around us. That we will share that hope, that joy, and that peace to a world that doesn't know it. And so as we go into communion today, um, it's a good time to just sit and reflect before you come up and, and, and take of the bread and, and the, the juice. Take a time to think about how you think about Jesus today. How are you going to think about Jesus tomorrow? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four through 25 says, 
And when he gave, had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. He said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus knew we were a forgetful people. We see it through the entire Bible that people just walk away. Today is one of those times to refocus us back. It's one of those times for us to look and to remember not only did he come as a baby, but he also died for a purpose. And so we take communion today. And I also want to bring up uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 31, because he also tells us, Paul tells us, let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you. You have fallen asleep and were prop if we're properly judging ourselves, would not be judged. What Paul was talking about here is in that time, they were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. And so Paul tells people to, to examine their hearts and that also this is for believers. So if you are not a Christian, if you do not believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I hope that that's something that you would like to pursue. I'd love to have conversations with you about this Jesus that we talked about today. But this is a way that Jesus had commanded his followers, his believers, to come. He says we're supposed to deal with our sins, ask for forgiveness. We can do that today. So take some time, spend some time in prayer. Then when you're ready, our worship team will be up here and they'll play while you're, while you're praying. And then when you're ready, come and take the elements. Let me pray for us today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Jesus, you, you created everything. Everything was created by you, through you, and for you, Lord, that I pray that we open our eyes today and we recognize that we exist only because you wanted us to. That each and every one of us was created by you, specifically. That none of us were accidents, none of us were unintentional, Lord. But I'd also pray that those that that have not been reconciled back to you through belief and faith in you, that they, their hearts would be burdened, that your Holy Spirit would open them to, to ask questions or at least to, to seek out what it means to be a follower of you, Lord. Lord, we thank you that, that we can come and, and hear your word and, and the humor of catching things on fire, um, that you're still in control of everything that um, if everything were to go south today, we would still be with you in heaven, Lord. I pray as we come into this time of communion and remembrance that we will remember you, that we will examine our hearts, and that we know that everything that we've ever done that was against you, Lord, you still paid the penalty for that. You still, in your love, came and died for us. Thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.